question. It's a great pleasure and honor for me to be here with you. And I welcome all of you to this event. Uh, as Mumtaz has said, I'm a political scientist and I've specialized in state and nation building in, in South Asia for most of my academic life. And that I focus my studies on Pakistan and especially Balochistan uh, is due to mere chance. Because as a young man, barely 20 years old, I decided to uh, expand my horizons and travel across Asia after graduating from high school and before starting my studies at university, as many people of my generation did at that time. Um, and at that time, the whole, world, the whole world was actually looking at China, the awakening giant, the new economic power and regional power and perhaps future world power. And the Tiananmen massacre was just three years ago, and I was quite disturbed by the consequencelessness of this student uprising. So um, I decided to go to China first. My first destination, I spent three months in the People's Republic of China, traveled from Beijing to Kashgar, from Lhasa to Shanghai, and left the country by Hong Kong, which at that time was still a British crown colony. But even after three months in China, I didn't really understand much of the country. And my next destination was India. I thought after the greatest dictatorship in the world, I should also have a look at the greatest democracy in the world, especially since both countries, of course, for centuries have been in conflict uh, and uh, uh, competition with each other. And India was somehow much more familiar to me than China. Here, English was spoken, so I could talk to the people, exchange ideas, and even read books and the newspapers. But then slowly my time away was coming to an end and the question arose of how to get back home and start my studies in time. And without much thinking, I set out to travel back overland to Europe. There was still Iran and Anatolia on the map which I wanted to see. And when I indeed got an uh, Iranian transit visa against my expectations, I just went to the border in Amritsar, took a rickshaw to Wagga and walked across to Pakistan. And to be honest, until that moment I did not really know that there was anything at all between the Iranian and the Indian cultural areas. Of course on the map I could see there were two countries, Afghanistan and Pakistan, but from my point of view this was something like a no-man's land that had to be crossed in order to get home. So when I crossed the border and reached Lahore half an hour later, I was completely confused. I had crossed an international border, I had entered a new country, only to find that here exactly everything was the same as across the border where I came from. Same climate, same people, same food, even same language. Lahore was like the small version of Delhi and Karachi was to me the slightly smaller brother of Bombay. But why two different countries? Of course my guidebook told me it had something to do with religion, but I couldn't really understand it. Because also in India there were millions of Muslims and thousands of mosques. So, while in Pakistan, Najibullah was lynched and hanged from a lamppost in Kabul, that was 1992, and a return trip uh, via Afghanistan was thus out of question. And very reluctantly, I decided to bypass Afghanistan to the south. So, I took a train from Karachi to Quetta and wanted to see how I could get on from there. But now, again, the same happened in reverse. I reached Quetta and found to my great surprise that here now suddenly 
everything was completely different, although I had not crossed an international border. It was a different climate, different people, different food, different language. Men with huge turbans, long beards, and strange sandals dominated the cityscape, hung with Kalashnikovs and cartridge belts. And these people had, at least outwardly, nothing whatsoever to do with Pakistan or India. It was actually much more like I had imagined Afghanistan to be, but I was still in Pakistan. So during the first three or four weeks that I spent in Pakistan, it became clear to me that something was wrong with this country. Why are there borders? And why do these borders of the country not at the same time are cultural and linguistic borders? And why instead does a cultural and linguistic border run right through the middle of that country? I continued my travels. I went further via Nushki, Dalbandin, and Taftan to Zaidan, just to find out that again I crossed the state border, but nothing had changed. On both sides, everything was pretty much the same. Baluchistan, of course. It's only when I reached Kerman that I actually had the feeling I was in Iran, but that was 500 kilometers after crossing the border. So, I returned to Germany in late summer of 1992 and began my studies in political science. And from the very beginning, it was clear that this strange state called Pakistan would be my focus of interest and attention. I had experienced firsthand that Pakistan was obviously a very artificial state, but no one seemed to question it. I wanted to know more about this, and above all, I wanted to understand why there were people between Pakistan and Iran that were so very different from the populations to the east and west of it. There was an Afghanistan to the north, but there was obviously also a Baluchistan to the south, which didn't seem to belong anywhere. Uh, so back in Germany, in uh, Freiburg, I went to the university library and searched for literature on Baluchistan. And once again, I was literally knocked on my head because apart from a very few colonial reprints, there was exactly one book available on Baluchistan. And even that was more than 15 years old. Of course, I'm referring to Sally Harrison's In Afghanistan's Shadow, which perhaps many of you know. So, without really looking for it, I had somehow find my object of study. Something like a white spot on the world map of political science. Some unknown and unexplored territory. Soon, Baluchistan and its people became a love affair. And still today, 30 years later, I'm deeply in love with the country and its inhabitants. A love for life. I would say. As a scientist, of course, you have to keep your feelings and emotions under control and try to look at things and evaluate things as soberly and naturally as possible. This has always been difficult for me, I must admit, because it became clear very soon that injustice had been done in Baluchistan for more than 75 years. A people a nation was divided, dismembered, and instrumentalized by the British colonial power. And even after the end of the colonial area, uh, era, this nation had not succeeded in asserting itself and determining itself. The Baluch, of course, are not alone in this. There are many nations in the post-colonial world which have not succeeded in establishing their own nation-state. But hardly any other nation without a state receives as little attention as the Baluch and is so systematically ignored by world public opinion 
even at times when neighboring countries like Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan are in the focus of world attention, as of course was the case after the Soviet invasion in Afghanistan and the Islamic Revolution in Iran in 1979, and as was the case after 9-11, as we all know. Nations and nation-states are the globally accepted world order and practiced political system of today. Almost all states in the world claim to be nation-states and to represent the territorial and political homeland of a nation. Numerous theories have developed and emerged to explain why nations came up in the first place and what processes of nation building and nation making uh, are underway. However, scholars do very fundamentally disagree on the question of what a nation actually is, when they first appeared, and what came first, the nation or nationalism. And none of these many theories really offer conclusive arguments as to how and why nations and national movements do emerge. There are two very fundamentally different approaches to the problem of nationalism. One school of thought, and I believe that most of you here in this room are followers of this theory, this school of thought claims that nations and nationalism are naturally occurring, timeless phenomena, predating modernity. They view the world, that is, the entire humanity, to be divided into nations, each with its own character, history, and destiny. And for each nation there is a territory, a national homeland, which is uniquely associated with it. And they believe that each nation has a moral entitlement to a sovereign state, and they claim that the nation is the only fully legitimate basis of a state. The nation state is intended to guarantee the existence of the nation, to preserve its distinct identity, and to provide a territory when natural national culture and national ethos are dominant. Nationalism is something very basic and founded on innate attachments. Nationalists then typically date the origin of nations back to some very remote epoch in time and appeal to emotional and instinctive constraints as the ultimate explanation for national mobilization. The other school of thought believes just the opposite. The so-called modernists believe nations to be entirely modern and constructed. They believe that nations emerge due to particular historical, social and political circumstances and as a result of industrialization. In this view, it is not the nation that produces nationalism, but it's rather nationalism that invents or creates the nation as an objective response to the fundamental demands of industrialization. These modernists acknowledge that nationalism is often a traditionalistic ideology glorifying and recodifying an ostensibly ancient tradition, but they maintain that nations only tend to imagine themselves as old. Nations are a creation or a sociologically necessary phenomenon of modern industrial times. National identities are thus socially and politically constructed as category of understanding rather than being innately given. This suggests that nations, also ethnic groups in fact, are invented or imagined, usually by local elites who select symbols 
and use mythical terms that resonate with the contemporary society to convey a sense of unity. These elites usually mobilize the masses by employing cultural myths. They articulate simplistic formula which resolve insecurities of the masses. Nationalism diagnoses contemporary events and offers a simple answer to them, making complex situations easily understandable. And of course, nationalism offers a sense of security and well-being to the individuals. But nationalism is the construction of institutional or ideological frameworks offering identity and emotional security by sort of providing a diagnosis of contemporary disruptions and defining individuals as members of a community. That usually happens in the context of rapid social changes which disrupt and dislocate local communities. In fact, there are so-called instrumentalists, you could say radical modern, modernists, who claim that the category of nation does not correspond to any objective reality at all. Support for nationalism comes from those whose interests have been threatened by economic change or political oppression. Nationalism is a resource for the defense of individual interests and the common economic interests of a group. These instrumentalists postulate a sharp fracture between political economic elites and their followers, and they view nationalism as the manipulation of public feeling for the purpose of attaining or holding on to economic or political power. The Pakistan movement, the Pakistani nation and Pakistani nationalism is a case in point. In fact, Pakistan is a textbook example of modernist nationalism theory. As you know, there was no such thing as Pakistan before 1947. There was not even a Pakistan idea before 1940. And perhaps you are also aware of the fact that the Pakistan project was not well received by most Indian Muslims of the time. The Muslim majority populations in the West and East of the subcontinent did not see themselves threatened and oppressed by a three-quarters majority of Hindus and were indifferent and at times even hostile to the vision of an independent Muslim state. In Bengal, for instance, religious differences never played any important role. The Bengalis had seen themselves for centuries as an independent and proud cultural and linguistic nation. For them, irrespective of their faith, the incorporation into a future undivided India was much more of a problem. Similarly, the populations uh, in Baluchistan and the Khanat of Kalat had for centuries been quite unconcerned about Hindustani affairs and perceived themselves as not being part of India at all. The Pakistan idea was strongly opposed even by leading Muslim scholars of the time, and I will quote here Maulana Abul Kalam Azad, the president of the Khilafat movement of the 1920s and president of All India National Congress from 1939 to 1946, and later on for more than a decade even India's Minister of Education. He issued a statement in April 1946 that I would like to read at least in parts. I have considered from every possible point of view the scheme of Pakistan as formulated by the Muslim League. As an Indian, I have examined its implications for the future of India as a whole, examined its likely effects upon the fortunes of Muslims of India. 
Considering the scheme in all its aspects, I have come to the conclusion that it is harmful not only for Indians as a whole, but for Muslims in particular. And in fact, it creates more problems than it solves. I must confess that the very term of Pakistan goes against my grain. It suggests that some portions of the world are pure, Pak, while others are impure. Such a division of territories into pure and impure is un-Islamic and a repu repudiation of the very spirit of Islam. Islam recognizes no such divisions and the Prophet says, God has made the whole world a mosque for me. Furthermore, it seems that the scheme of Pakistan is a symbol of defectism and has been built upon on the analogy of the Jewish demand for a national home. It is a confession that Indian Muslims cannot hold their own in India as a whole and would be content to withdraw to a corner specifically reserved for them. As a Muslim, I am not prepared for a moment to give up my right to treat the whole of India as my domain and to share in the shaping of its political and economic life. To me it seems a sure sign of cowardice to give up what is my patrimony and content myself with the mere fragment of it. So, the political propagandists of the Pakistan idea were in fact a minority within the Muslim minority of India, undivided India. They were mainly courtiers, urban literati, civil servants who had risen in the colonial service, magnates and notables from north central India. It is this brutal speaking civil servant class that had created Muslim League in 1908 as its own professional interest and party organ. And from 1940 onwards, with Jinnah as sole spokesman, tried to push through the Pakistan project even against the overwhelming majority of illiterate, ignorant and indifferent Muslims. In fact, it was the Government of India Act of 1935 that fundamentally changed the political framework in British India and that resulted in the Muslim political and economic elite of North Central India to create a national movement and to invent the Pakistani nation for the purpose of attaining or holding on to economic and political power, just as the modernist theory claims. It is in 1936 that the colonial government, the Britishers, allowed elections on a larger scale for the first time. And it was about one-fifth of the adult population of India that could participate in these elections. And the result was very sobering for Muslim League. Congress had succeeded in winning the support of the majority of Hindu population and had a very high percentage of Muslim voters behind it. The Muslim League, in turn, did not win a single mandate and could not assert itself against other Muslim organizations. And this electoral defeat of 1936 and the prospect of a permanent political and economic marginalization made it absolutely necessary, I would even say imperative, to simply invent and create Pakistani nationalism and the Pakistani nation. It is thus a perfect example of nationalism being the manipulation of public feelings for the purpose of attaining a holding on to power. And in case of Pakistan, it is unusually obvious how much nationalism and nations are invented or created by local elites rather than being a naturally occurring phenomenon. It's also a prime example of national identities occur in the context of rapid 
social changes which disrupt and dislocate local communities rather than being a timeless phenomenon. Notions of common descent, common language, thank you. culture, music, literature, folklore, religion, territory and or history or history, historiography are simply invented, imagined and created. And in fact, there is no limit to the commons and commonalities that nationalism, in this case Pakistani nationalism, has created and invented and imagined. Be it national heroes, national slogans, national symbols, proverbs, colors, landmarks, mountains, rivers, food, dress, sport, flowers, animals, it's unlimited. All these national commons, however, were invented later. Initially, as you all know, there was only one single thing that all members of the Pakistani nation had in common, and that was religion. Initially, it was not common ancestry, not even common language, culture or tradition that defined Pakistani nation, but only and exclusively the common profession of the same faith. This is a historical uniqueness and an anomaly matched only by Israel. And it soon became obvious that the Pakistani national identity was built on sand. Of course, there are other religious states or even state religions, but apart from Pakistan and Israel, there is no other nation state that has made religion the sole raison d'être, reason of the state and nation. And no other nation states exist today solely because their inhabitants have the same religious affiliation. An understanding of the state based exclusively on religion is of course very, very problematic. There are numerous other nation states whose populations are almost exclusively Muslim. There are millions of Muslims in the Indian subcontinent who are not citizens of Pakistan. There are also people in Pakistan who are not Muslims but nevertheless citizens of the state. And last but not least, there are people within Pakistan who also profess the Islamic faith, faith but still do not consider themselves as part of the Pakistani nation. Here, of course, the Baluch are a case in point. And Mirgaus Baks Bijenjo, the later Baba e Baluchistan, explained in December 1947, and I quote him, We, the Baluch, have a distinct civilization. We have a separate culture like that of Iran and Afghanistan. We are Muslims, but it is not necessary that by the virtue of our being Muslims, we should lose our freedom and merge with others. If the mere fact that we are Muslims requires us to join Pakistan, then Afghanistan and Iran, both Muslim countries, should also amalgamate with Pakistan. Byzantine Saib made an obvious point. If Islam was indeed the state constituting feature of Pakistan, then Pakistan had to stretch from Indonesia to Morocco. Of course, no one ever claimed this or demanded this. Iqbal and Jinnah and the Muslim elites of India had the subcontinent in mind. Pakistan was to be the home of all the Muslims of the Indian subcontinent. But where does the subcontinent end and where does it begin? Who belongs to it and who doesn't? And why are there almost equal numbers of Muslims in India, Bangladesh and Pakistan today? According to Jinnah's two-nation theory, they are all Pakistanis, but it's still just one-third of the Muslim population of the subcontinent that are today citizens of the state. What is with the rest? Are they Pakistani nationals in exile? Definitely not. 
Mia Ba, the former Burma, is also part of the Indian subcontinent. And I think all of you know that the Muslims of that country, the Rohingyas, have been anything else than welcomed in Pakistan in the past. But let's turn to Baluchistan and the Baluch. Historically, they have never been part of India. In fact, even the British never considered Baluchistan or the Khanat of Kalat as being part of India. Instead, they created in Baluchistan pretty much the same buffer state as they did in Afghanistan. And upon their withdrawal from the subcontinent, Baluchistan or Kalat should have or could have maintained the same position as Afghanistan to the north. Making it part of Pakistan in 1948 by occupation and by having the Khan signing an instrument of accession under duress was a random and arbitrary, at least a unilateral decision on the side of Pakistan. And a decision definitely not based on the two nation theory. The decision was based on compelling necessity. For without Balochistan, today's Pakistan would only be half its size, a thin strip of territory along the Indus River, with no strategic depth, with no natural resources, not even with much of a coastline to speak of. But at that time, 1948, the Khan was weak, the Baluch national movement was still in its infancy, and the opportunity was just favorable. Above all, there was no one in the world, and there still isn't anyone today, who would have stood by the Baluchis. Not Great Britain, not the United States, not the Soviet Union or Russia, not India, not Iran or Afghanistan. On the contrary, Afghanistan and also Iran have repeatedly claimed Baluchistan for themselves. And if Pakistan had not seized and occupied that piece of land in 1948, I would suppose that probably Afghanistan or Iran would have done so subsequently. So why did the Baluch not manage to preserve and defend their Khanat? Why has the Baluchi national movement not succeeded in more than 75 years in asserting its right to self-determination, or at least gain a certain amount of autonomy within Pakistan. Among many other reasons, such as, of course, world politics, Cold War, East-West bloc formation, centralism and authoritarianism in Pakistan, it is probably the lack of unity and the lack of continued and accepted leadership of the movement. A successful national movement needs a Gandhi or a Garibaldi or an Ataturk or a Jinnah, a sole spokesman universally recognized within and outside the nation. A leader who unites and connects who overcomes and bridges regional, local and tribal affiliations and differences and thus shows and makes the rest of the world understand we are one and we stand united. Until today, no one has been able to play this role. No Nawab Khayabakshmari, no Akbar Bukti, no Menga, no Bizenjo. None of thousands of BSO activists or numerous guerrilla leaders of the past have been able to fulfill or to fill this role. No Sher Muhammad Mali, no Aslam Baluch, no Allah Nazar. None of them has ever enjoyed the trust of the entire nation or be able to unite the Baluch nation as a whole. Without a national integration figure, however, the struggle seems pretty hopeless to me, especially today when the state of Pakistan and the military apparatus is using all its power and violence to suppress 
persecute, abduct, and kill, forcing you and thousands of others to flee the country and seek refuge in a distant place. Thank you for your attention. Uh, as you were saying that uh, if uh, Pakistan was not able to capture Balochistan, either Iran or Afghanistan was the same case. On what basis? Uh, yeah, they were weak, this okay. But what are the other basis of this, your, uh, what you said about that? Uh, well, of course, either country would have uh, argued historically. And historically, the Khanar of Khalar has been subordinate to the Kingdom of Kabul for centuries. And Afghani, especially Pashtun nationalists, and their vision of a greater Pashtunistan does include all of Baluchistan as well, being sort of a minor province of a greater Pashtunistan. Similarly, uh, Iran has very reluctantly accepted, I mean, and the Durand line, of course, was never accepted by the Pashtuns, for obvious reasons, because it cuts through uh, their settlement area. The case is quite similar with the border of uh, Iran and Pakistan. Uh, it has been contested well into the 50s, and Iran repeatedly made claims to certain areas, um, which the Britishers had somehow attached to the Khanad of Kalab, but which historically was much closer linked uh, to the Persian kingdom. Um, and to me, it, it, it's just a matter of historical guessing because the Baluch and the Khanad were in no position um, to defend themselves against anybody who claimed that territory. And if, I would suppose if Pakistan hadn't succeeded, uh, maybe Afghanistan and the greater Pashtunistan movement, which was very alive well into the 60s, uh, would perhaps try the same. But that's very much my, yes, yeah, yes, my yeah. personal guess yeah. how, how it would, if Pakistan wouldn't have been <coughs> sort of the evildoer, I'm afraid one of these other two countries would have tried the same. Uh, yeah, anybody else? Thank you. Uh, my name is Abdul Wajid. I'm a member of the Revolution Movement. My question for you, uh, nowadays China's uh, growing influence in our region is more stronger than before. And recent China's effort to bring Saudi and Iran together for the recent talks can have an effect on the Baloch movement, recent stocks, China's effort? Um, yes and no. I think Balochistan as a territory is vital to the functioning of CPEC, the Belt and Road Initiative, and this whole Silk Route thing. Baluchistan is an integral, a very important part to make it functioning. So, of course, uh, China has great interest in pacifying the region or at least keep conflict low. Um, if the Baluch continue in future as they've done for a long time in the past, to blow up pipelines, bridges, railway tracks, <coughs> and roads, <coughs> CPEC will not work, for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. At the same time, um, it, it puts the Baluch in a position where others, like China, might be forced to hear and adhere to the demands that the people have. Because with the guerrilla warfare, the Baluch are in a position to disturb and disrupt <coughs> at any time. 
if no agreement or arrangement is found, um, the whole Belt and Road Initiative, at least in this part of the world, will not come, come off and kick off. So I think they are both, there's a great potential and there's a great danger. Um, but it is geostrategically, today, with CPEC on its way, of course, a very important, strategically important region of the world. That is a great, perhaps it's the greatest asset that the Baluch have today. I hope this answers your question a little bit. Anybody else? No, my name is Jacob, um, and I'd have a question um, concerning what you what you said uh, concerning the um, how how the movement could be successful. You mentioned that uh, maybe something like a leading person uh, would be beneficial. Uh, to the, towards the success of the movement um, and my question was uh, if you might have anything to add uh, concerning um, structural, uh, maybe structural conditions which might have hindered uh, such a person gaining a platform or how uh, one might uh, sort of further, uh, further the de development of, uh, of people who could become such a person. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I, I would go a little further. A leadership, <coughs> a leadership figure is not beneficial, but it's crucial. It's the prerequisite of a successful national movement. And if such a person would have emerged earlier or at any time in the last 75 years, I would suppose that the movement would have been a lot more successful. Without a universally accepted leadership figure, it's just not going to work. It works nowhere. It has worked nowhere in the world. Which is part also of the modernist theory. It's nationalism is never really a matter of the masses rising up for their nationhood feeling, but it's elites, leaders, who instrumentalize nationalist feelings for their own purpose, gaining or holding on to power. Why it has not worked in, in, in Baluchistan so far is, is, I think, quite simple to explain because Baluchistan is also a very diverse country <coughs> and a very diverse nation. In a way, it is as artificial as any nation. You could easily say there is no Baluch nation. It's not a matter of facts. It's not if you have territory, language, culture, history, then you have everything you need. It's, it's, that's what I've tried to explain with this theoretical part at the beginning, that this is not enough. Um, you need um, Although it is instrumentalized very often in a negative way, as in a way I've outlined the becoming, the birth of Pakistan. But it's not a matter of good or bad, it's just a matter of what you actually need. Any nation, all nationalisms are, is a political instrumentalization, which is just necessary. One, I think one has to accept that as a fact. That doesn't make it good or bad. It's just the fact that you need such a thing. Um, I think the, the the greatest problem, or the main reasons why the Baluch national movement has never succeeded in bringing out one universally accepted leader, is simply the fact that the Baluch are divided amongst at least three states. Iran, Afghanistan, and Iran, with colonial borders purposely cutting the Baluch nation into pieces, just as they have done with the Pashtuns 
And as colonial powers have done everywhere in the world, that was part of their strategy, divide and rule. Uh, but of course nowadays, in times when the whole world is divided into nation states, these borders are actually a border. It is difficult to organize a people across international state borders. Um, on top of it, if we even just look at Pakistani Baluchistan and forget about the Iranian and Afghan parts, uh, even the Balochistan that is now part of, of Pakistan is very diverse. A Mari tribesman has as much in common with the middle class intellectual of Makran like um, like a farmer from Sicily, in southern Italy, has in common with a Swedish shepherd. It is a very different social, socio-economic and tribal conditions, which has always made it difficult for a, a leader to emerge. Of course, all of these Many of these tribal sadars I've mentioned, of course, Bukti, Mangal, Mari, they all had these ambitions. They all wanted to be the leader and be accepted as the leader. But they had been in, in conflict and competition for all their life. And the same is true for non-tribal political activists or leaders. A, a, a non-tribal person from Makran is perhaps difficult except for people who are still very much living in, in tribal traditions, where the Sadar is like the godfather of the whole tribe. So it is very difficult circumstances um, for, for leadership to emerge. Thank you. Anybody else? Hello, uh, I am Bibagar Baloch, activist of Three Baloch Sun Movement. Uh, Baloch uh, know their enemies uh, in who occupied Balochistan and who is in want to invade Baloch resources in Balochistan. What do you think about the, who will be the uh, friend of Balochistan? It will be Russia, it will be USA or uh, Germany or UK. What do you say, what will be the, uh, in future, who will be the friend of Balochistan and Baloch? As I said in the past, Balochistan never really had any friends. Not even at the height of the Cold War did the Soviet Union do anything worth mentioning in making the movement successful. And I think Oh, I, I consider it next to impossible sort of to, to win a dear friend in form of a state, perhaps a regional or even a world power standing by your side. For, for the perspective of the United States or even for Russia, even for China, Balochistan is too unimportant in order to risk losing other friends when you support them. I, I see the, the only long-term solution in, in propaganda and in public awareness. The case of Balochistan is still not known in the world. No one knows about Balochistan, no one knows about the conflict going on there for such a long time. What you need is world attention. Um, and as long as, as a universally accepted leader is not in sight, uh, you just need the press, journalists, reporting, conferences, influencing public opinion, making the case more known to the outside world. And if there is public attention on the case, then 
one or the other state or government might be forced to recognize the problem and perhaps intervene. Uh, but I think no country in the world will do so without either a personal economic or strategic interest uh, or with the voters of that country more or less forcing the government to take um, rec to recognize this conflict and, and become active. Um, I think it is a, a very long and, and difficult struggle and as I've said for me it's I cannot comprehend uh, why when the region was so much in the focus of attention you know, for the last 20 years we had the war on terror or enduring freedom or whatever it was called I've never heard anything about Baluchistan in these 20 years although it is next door um, in a way, I would say it's a big lack of public relations on side of the movement. Although I cannot really tell you how to do it better, it's always, of course, a matter of resources as well. Um, but you need to, I think it's more promising to influence or to try to influence public world opinion than to pin your hopes on an individual state that might come to your help and rescue. Anybody else? Uh, is it schwierig, when I Deutsch spreche? You versteht das. Das ist schön. I am uh, Franziska from the MLPD, Marxistisch-Leninistische Partei Deutschlands, and for us is the proletarische Internationalismus eine Lebensaufgabe. And deshalb sind wir mit dem Herzen auch bei eurem Kampf. Ich finde, was im Moment in diesem Vortrag, der mich sehr beeindruckt hat, fehlt oder mir fehlt, ist, dass das Ganze eine Frage der Klassenkämpfe ist. Wir leben im Imperialismus und wenn solche Konflikte sind, eben auch die kurdischen Konflikte, dann ist das doch eine Klassenfrage. Wer unterdrückt wen? Und das bedeutet, das Volk ist auch entscheidend und davon höre ich nichts. Ihr seid, ihr habt eine eigene Bewegung. Was macht diese Bewegung? Ich glaube nicht, dass die Hilfe von außen kommt. Ihr braucht die Solidarität, es muss bekannt werden, das stimmt. Ich wusste vorher auch nichts von Baluchistan, bevor ich dich kennenlernte. Aber es ist keine Frage, was ich auch ganz richtig und wichtig finde, es braucht Führung. Aber es kann keine schillernde Figur vorne stehen, sondern es muss innerhalb der Bewegung eine Partei sein, eine kommunistische Führung, eine Partei, die, der die Massen vertrauen und dann kann man das gemeinsam organisiert machen. Aber ich glaube nicht, dass es ohne Verständnis dieses imperialistischen Systems geht. Danke. As I understand, that was not really a question, but just a remark. And I okay. wouldn't really know what, <laughs> yeah. what yeah. the question was. Yeah, it was in. almost well, a remark. Yeah. yeah, okay. So, anybody else? Hello, my name is Najib, and I'm from FPM party. And uh, I would like to ask, in your opinion, why Baloch national struggle is not getting international support? and why the human rights uh, organization or human rights defenders have uh, shut their eyes and they have turned their face towards Baloch, the Pakistan and Iran, what they are doing towards the Baloch people? Uh, that's very simple for me to answer because I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know, but I'm asking myself this question for 30 years now. Why is no one paying attention to Baluchistan? Sorry, I don't know. I wish I had the answer. <coughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Hi, I'm uh, Lobak Mari. Uh, my question uh, to you is, uh, in the event of China's uh, successful development of Gwadar, uh, 
What do you think? How much of a threat does it pose to Europe? How much trade? Of a threat. Uh -huh, to trade. Europe. To Europe. Uh, if China succeeds uh, in development, uh, developing water or um, gaining ground in water. Yeah, you see. I mean, I know Guadar, and I know the deep sea port in Guadar even before there was SIPAC. SIPAC came later. First, the deep sea port was built, and the Makran Coastal Highway, by Nawaz Sharif's third government, and Musharraf continued. There wasn't even talk of any SIPAC. At that time, the deep sea port was not at all linked to China. It was claimed to be an entry point and an exit point for trade and natural resources of Central Asia. That's how Nawaz Sharif and Musharraf sold the whole project. Um, I have never understood how Gwadar, just due to its geographical location, can play any role in trade because there is no consumer population which you can reach by Gwadar. You go to Gwadar, it's Baluchistan, very sparsely populated. There, there, there is no demand for consumer goods that would reach Baluchistan by Gwadar. I see no potential there. And the other way around is, is the same. There are no roads and railways that uh, come from Central Asia or Afghanistan going down to Gwadar, which would be geographically the nearest point at the coast. Um, but there has never been any construction of the necessary infrastructure. So when Gwadar was actually kicked off in 99, 2000, uh, I really was at a loss to understand what is the reason for that. And back then, the dominant theory was actually it has nothing to do with trade and transit, but is perhaps one of these, it's called string of pearls or something, that the actual aim and ambition is to have for the Chinese to have sort of a naval base there, that it has rather mm, military strategic interests and not trade. Nowadays things look a little different, the port is there, and mind you, I mean you have the Guada deep sea port, and then a, a road going along the coast to Karachi. Macron Coastal Highway, which absolutely makes no sense. I mean, why should you bring things to Guadar and then put it on trucks and bring it along the Coastal Highway to Karachi and then go up north? Um, but of course, I'm aware of the fact that uh, in the meantime, things have changed a little bit. Some roads are being built from Guadar heading to Hoshab, basically to Quetta and then northwards. There will be maybe one or two roads. I don't know if they will actually manage to, to build a railway track as well. Um, but it will be sort of a port with one or two arteries leaving that port. There's, in foreseeable future, there will be no economically interesting hinterland to Guadar. Um, so things in future perhaps will arrive in Guadar and be shipped on to China and vice versa. But honestly speaking, I don't really see this materializing. Um, perhaps you are aware, we, we do have this Karakorum Highway, this strategic link road to China since the late 60s. And back then it was celebrated as a very important 
economic yeah. road as well. Promises of lots of trade between China and Pakistan. But um, most of us will know that the Karakoram Highway is closed from September to May. More than half of the year the road is not usable because it's snow covered. So whatever exchange has taken place in the past 30, 40 years on that Karakoram Highway was always limited to a few months of the year. That is not really an economic link road that makes sense. I think even the old Karakoram Highway was more of more of a measure to make Pakistan feel that China is a very good big old friend in the north to it. But it never had any economic reasoning behind it. And concerning the new CPEC, I'm not really in a position to say if this is going to work out or not. I know the Karakoram Highway, I know the terrain, and I would say that is not a good and natural trade route, because it will be closed for perhaps half of the year. This is not a link where you can have reliable trade and exchange on a daily basis. But who knows? I mean, the Chinese have managed to build a railway to Lhasa in Tibet, which was always considered impossible. They have managed, it's running day and night, 365 days a year. So I don't know if they will build a huge tunnel through the whole Karakoram, um, but I think it, it has not. The real potential of CPEC that I see not as an expert, but just as an observer, is definitely much less than the hype that is behind CPEC. Concerning any <coughs> trade advantages for Europe, I don't know, I mean, what, what would you expect to be shipped from Guada to Europe or to world markets in general? Products coming from China on road through the Karakoram all the way to Guada and then being shipped to Europe? I don't think that makes much sense. Um, Guada in any case, as it looks right now, can only be sort of a, a transit post or a warehouse, but there's no there are no products from the surrounding area that could be shipped from Guada. And if you bring products to Guada, there is no consumer population in the hinterland that would be interested or could afford these products. So I think it is, it is, it is more a matter of politics, strategic and military thinking with trade being sort of the alibi to make people believe that is a nice and useful thing. Um, but I must admit frankly as well, I'm not an, an expert on CPEC, but I've been just observing it very critically since the late 90s. I think I couldn't really answer your question, but I tried my best. <laughs> Thank you very much. Anybody else? <coughs> If nobody else, then I will ask a question. Please. And my question is that that uh, in your uh, sorry in your speech you mentioned that Balochistan is not having a unified leadership, and that is the reason uh, Baloch have not been able to uh, sustain something for a long time. Uh, and the reasons you uh, showed or you discussed are the tribal uh, uh, hardships and uh, the political differences and stuff like that. 
Uh, don't you think that as uh, you have already visited Baluchistan several times, I don't know uh, if you have visited uh, Western Baluchistan, but Eastern Baluchistan is the place where I met you, so I know you have visited it several times. Don't you think uh, the way the suppressors are suppressing the nation is the leading reason behind uh, uh, spreading, you know, uh, getting uh, the message spread it. Uh, you have seen how the media works there, and now uh, Mr. Sotoza will also uh, show, throw some light or uh, the media uh, stuff. Uh, I myself, I will give you my example, till I was not in the university, I myself did not know that I am a different person. I am a different individual. I thought I am a Pakistani. So if the, the, the people are raised up like that, uh, the literature, the schools, the, the universities, the colleges, like everything is focusing on diverting the Baluch nation from its nation, nationalism, history and stuff like that. So don't you think this is also, uh, I would say, the biggest reason is this behind or uh, considering something else as a reason? What, do you, what, what is your opinion? Um, of course, if, if there is not a movement with a considerable force that makes you afraid, then there would be nothing to suppress. Um, so, just the fact that the Pakistani military establishment is committing such gross atrocities in Baluchistan for the past 15 years shows that the Pakistani military establishment is afraid doing using all its resources to kill the intellectual elite of the Baluch, to literally abduct and kill all those people on a systematic basis that have the potential of leading the Baluch national movement to success. Um, so the harsh suppression by the Pakistani military establishment can be viewed as a success of the movement. Otherwise there would be nothing to, to suppress. Um, what was the second part of your question? My second part was uh, that the leadership is not emerging because of uh, the mm. political hardships and Nothing is allowed, like uh, a leader can contact the people once he has got a free access or she has got a free access. Now uh, in Balochistan, uh, being an individual, not claiming even uh, being a leader, just an individual who talks about Baluch and Balochistan, he disappears and after some days we receive his dead body. So don't you think that is also uh, playing the much bigger role in, you know, um, limiting the Baluch political uh, awareness or mm. advancement? Um, well, concerning leadership, perhaps I should clarify. Um, a leader, I'm not necessarily talking about a political leader or even a, a militant leader, it could be very much a spiritual figure. It could be a person sitting in a grave and meditating 24 hours a day, but someone with whom the entire nation sort of identifies as the spiritual leader, the godfather. I mean, I think KB has played this role for quite some time. Nawab Khayabakshmari, he was not really an active leader, but very much a spiritual leader. From basically from his return from uh, Afghanistan in 1992 till uh, his death. Um, and when I talk of, of leadership, 
I'm actually having much more in mind a spiritual leader and not really a, a field commander or a general sort of who leads the forces. Oh, um, so perhaps this needed to be clarified. I mean, it could be basically anybody. Um, the second thing I think we, we all should also should be frank. Um, traditionally, that's that's part of the social structure. Their peace with the British, and when the British left, they made their peace with Pakistan. And always sort of looking for their own interest uh, and not thinking in terms of nationalism at all. So I think the social structure of the Baluch people um, is is not positive in bringing about an accepted leadership because it's very much fragmented into tribes and into regions. Um, and the third point, perhaps, um, Baluchistan has no or hardly any urban centers. It is a very rural country and I mean, the only city you have is Quetta, but that is half Pashto and half Baluch, so even Quetta is sort of not the urban center of the Baluch. And perhaps Karachi is actually much more important than Quetta for the Baluch and their movement. But then Karachi is home to even more ethnic groups and sub-nations than, uh, than Quetta is. But I think this is also... A, a Perhaps not a precondition, but it's a nice thing to have that at least there's one big urban center on your territory um, where there is uh, intellectual elite, where um, students meet, where newspapers are concentrated and, 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 and published. And this is something that the Baluch are, are missing because all other places, be it I don't know, Gwara, Panjgul, Tulbad, Hoshab, Aroham, Kalat. These are all just bigger villages, but not really urban centers where anything could sort of concentrate and, 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 and develop. I think this is also a great hindrance to, to the success of the movement. Which is, again, like so many things, uh, of course, fall of the British. Kalat could have developed into a considerable city if the Britishers had not sort of created Quetta out of nothing. It was a tiny small village. But since the British decided to develop Quetta, have this as the headquarter for the army uh, and the administration and have all roads and links go through Quetta, uh, the rest of Baluchistan uh, didn't see any development at all. It was just the British territories, which were largely Pashtun territories, Luralai, Job, and all these northern areas. Um, they had sort of forms of modernity coming to them in the way that an urban center developed in today's. Baluch territories, there's not a single city that would deserve the name city. That is also a hindrance, I would say. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, we had enough uh, for the first station. Thank you very much. Uh, we uh, would like to go for a break uh, outside here, uh, coffee and some tea. So we will be back in 30 minutes if they are enough and then further continue with the other guests. <laughs>